welcome everybody. And a warm welcome. It's great to be with you. Uh, as you can tell, I am not from Fife. I am from the city of Edinburgh. I've been living here for 34 years and I've originally hailed from New Jersey. I want to speak first about just to give you a little bit of context about what it means for me to serve in the prison. I'm a prison chaplain. I've been there for 20 years as a chaplain, but I've been visiting prison for probably 30 years. And I thought to introduce that aspect of ministry, there's a verse in Deuteronomy. It's one of these that you can remember easily, the double verses, Deuteronomy 15, 15, which is associated with John Newton. Remember John Newton, Amazing Grace, the slave ship captain, the man who had a past, the man who was a blasphemer, the man who was godless, has this life-changing encounter with Jesus, and he sums up the story, you know, the familiar words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And the verse that Newton often referred to, and this was actually uh, inscribed above the mantelpiece in his vicarage in Olney was Deuteronomy 1515. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. Remember. And I think it's important for us to remember that we have a past, that where we are now is not where we once were. And whatever we have succeeded in doing, achieved, etc., is not because of us, but is because of God himself. So you see, you know, in, in, in Egypt, the people of God were in captivity. They were slaves. They could not free themselves. And the Lord Jesus uses this language of sin and slavery and says, whoever sins is a slave to sin. But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So Newton often looked back, and he looked back to see what he was, but he also looked back to see what the Lord had done. In Edinburgh Prison today, there's about 930 prisoners. We are jam-packed. The Scottish Prison Service is at capacity, is above capacity. That doesn't uh, suggest that our Scottish um, nation is in a healthy place where the prisons are overcrowded, but they are. We have men, we used to have men and women, we now have men, and they are serving sentences from several months to several years to, as far as you can see, the rest of their natural life. So 930 men, uh, some, it's their first time in prison, but many are repeat visitors, they leave, they come back, and they're slaves, they're captives. They are captive to addiction, captive to crime, shame, guilt, backgrounds of abuse and misuse, and they themselves cannot free themselves. And I, I think we need to remind ourselves that we can't free ourselves from sin, we can't fix the problems that we have created, nor can they. So Newton, John, or Deuteronomy 15, 15, but through the benefits of Google, I, I found a picture of this mantelpiece in Olney, Buckinghamshire, and there were two verses, Deuteronomy 15, 15, yes, but the second verse I want to share with you, which kind of bookends what I want to say about prison ministry is Isaiah 43, 4. Isaiah 43, 4 says this, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Three words that are used to describe the audience, precious, honored, and loved. And that reminds me powerfully that people are important, all kinds of people, people in prison, people in hospital, young people at school, older people. God has created us. He's created us in his image. 
He has given us value, worth, meaning, purpose. And without Jesus, people are lost. They need to be found. People are blind. They need to see. People are dead spiritually. They need to be made alive. And these two verses, which kind of shape the ministry of John Newton, remember what you were, remember what God has done, and this reminder of the intrinsic value of human beings and that special value that all of God's people have. Because in prison ministry, I guess I prison ministry is twofold. You are sharing good news, gospel, and that will be my text in, in, a, in a moment. I'm going to be speaking from Romans chapter 1. So you're sharing the gospel one-to-one -one and from the pulpit, and you are meeting people literally where they are. So they need to hear that there's hope. They need to hear that there's comfort. They need to hear that God is able. And in prison, as in the community, there's a lot of good programs that are happening. You know, there are programs that help people deal with addiction. That's good. There are programs that help people deal with violence. That's good. There are programs that deal with other forms of offending. That's good. There are programs that help people make better decisions. That's good. But all of these programs don't change the human heart. God does. And I'm persuaded that God changes people from the inside out. I know my story I came to Scotland 34 years ago. I was not a Christian. I did not believe in God. I did not read the Bible. I did not go to church. I didn't pray. If you had asked me, I would have said I'm basically a good person, better than average, better than most. But And I thought that I knew what Christianity was. Basically, uh, Christianity is what Christians believe. Christianity is a way of making you maybe a better person, but I had no idea that Christianity was about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I do now. The only reason I do now is that I was invited by a friend to church. I was given a Bible, and part of my ministry in the prison is doing just that, encouraging people to come along to hear the message and giving copies of God's word. The Gideons give us hundreds of copies, thousands of copies of the Bible. And over the 20 years that I've been in ministry as a chaplain, hundreds and thousands of Bibles given away. And I'm persuaded that people, when they read God's word, that God speaks and God's word is powerful and God's word is personal and God's word is transformative. So each of us as Christians have a sphere. Now, that your sphere of influence might be your home, your family, might be your neighbors, might be the people that you work with, might be you know the, the members of your local church community, but each one of us has a sphere. And I think God is calling us to be faithful. He's calling us to be uh, consistent. He's calling us to be um, his witnesses in this age. And I'm persuaded that the gospel, the message of Jesus, is good seed. And as a chaplain, I feel primarily that my calling is to sow the good seed. Remember the parable of the sower? The sower went forth to sow. And you look at it and you think, what an inefficient way of sowing seed because the sower scattered the seed everywhere. You know, if you or I were, I'm not a farmer, but you know, I would think to myself, I'm not gonna scatter seed there because it's never gonna grow there. I'm not gonna scatter seed there. It's never gonna grow there. But no, the, the sower is to sow seed. And you and I, we are to sow the good seed, which is, is the gospel, the word of God. And we let God do the rest. God is able to make the soil receptive to the seed. He's able to make the heart receptive to the gospel. I can't do that. I can't change people. When I became a Christian, I thought that I could help fix people. 
help fix their problems, help solve their difficulties. I'm not a good problem solver, but I know someone who is. I'm not a good fixer. I know someone who is. I can't change someone's heart, but I know someone who does. So with those verses in mind, I've had the privilege of preaching and visiting, um, sharing the gospel, giving out Bibles. I'll tell you, the first experience I had in prison I thought was going to be my last. I, I was a volunteer for many years at Bethany, and you might be aware of Bethany. Bethany used to be an Edinburgh-based Christian charity. It's now all over. It's in Fife, it's in Dundee, Aberdeen, Glasgow, all over. And Bethany Christian Trust primarily focuses upon homelessness and the causes of homelessness. And a group of us went to Bethany House in the summer of 94, a long time ago, and we began to meet people, talk to people, get to know people, become friends with people. And I remember one of these guys, Paul, and I was new to Scotland. So Paul was from Govan, which is in Glasgow, and Paul was a fervent supporter of Glasgow Celtic. Now, I didn't see the con the, the, the unusual um, contrast there because now I know that most people in Govan support a different team, like the, the local team in Govan is not Glasgow Celtic, but Glasgow Rangers. But anyway, Paul was a resident at Bethany and he was regularly coming to church. And one Sunday he was at the church, he came to my home for lunch, and we went down to Bethany on a Monday night, and the Monday night we were told that Paul wasn't there. Where is he? And the answer was, Paul is on remand. What's that? Well, remand is where you're held in prison pending trial. And the next question, of course, was what happened? And what happened was Paul brandished a sword at the ha uh, Bethany House manager when he was asked to leave. Now, in case you didn't realize, brandishing a sword is a criminal offense, and Paul was imprisoned. And I remember writing to him. I had to look up the address of the prison in the phone book. This was pre-internet. So you go to the phone book, HMP Edinburgh, 33 Stenhouse Road, EH11, uh, 3LN. And I wrote and I said, dear Paul, is there anything I can do? And Paul said, yes. Could you visit? To be honest, I was hoping he would say, can you send me five pounds? Could you send me some stamps? But he said, could you come in? And I thought, mm, prison is scary. They're scary people. I'm a student. I'm studying Scottish history. Uh, anyway, so I asked, he said, so I went. And I remember it so vividly. We're waiting in the visit room. Everybody gathers, and then you're brought over to see the guys, and you're sitting opposite them at a table. But as we were sitting there, two women who were visiting the same man, they didn't know of each other's existence. They had the idea that they were each visiting this man on their own. And when they realized that they had both planned to visit the same man, they were not particularly happy to make each other's acquaintance. And all of a sudden, a fight broke out. And I thought to myself, I've never seen this, two women fighting in this way. And I thought to myself, if these are the visitors, what are the residents like? Anyway, I, instead of that being my first visit and last visit, that was the first of, that was 30 years ago. So I've been going in and out of jail ever since. So that's a little bit about what prison ministry looks like. And I'd ask you to pray. I'd ask you to pray that people that are given a Bible would read it. I ask that people that come to church would hear the gospel, not just with their ears, but with their heart, and that God would enable them to respond, and that God would continue to be true to his word. If you turn with me to the Bible, I want to read a few verses from Romans chapter 1, in a meeting like this, I, I, I always revert to my favorite passages. So when I'm asked to give a message, I thought, well, I can't give a better message tonight than Romans chapter 1. Let's read the opening 17 verses. I'm going to speak on verse 16, but let's read the context. Romans chapter 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle 
and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness. How constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times, and I pray that now at last, by God's will, you, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have not, but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am bound, both to Greeks and to non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as, is, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Amen. So this verse, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. This verse reminds us of what the gospel is and of what the gospel does. Whether you are ministering in a community, ministering in prison, hospital, whatever the setting, here in Scotland, down south in England, across the Atlantic to the United States, to the south, southern hemisphere, continent of Africa, Asia, wherever. The gospel message is what it is and does what it does. And that's what gives me and gives us hope. You see, Christian witness is not what we do for Jesus. Christian witness, Christian service, is pointing people to what he has done for them. So with you tonight, I just want to make a few points from the passage. Nothing too dramatic, but I hope helpful and relevant. First and foremost, what we have is the fact that the gospel is literally good news. That's what it means. You know that. Gospel, the good news concerning Jesus Christ. Now, I'm a history person, so I'm going to give you a couple of little history lessons. When he was just 26, or 25 even, John Calvin was asked to write a preface to the French edition of the New Testament. His cousin was a translator, translated Greek into French. John Calvin writes an introduction Listen to this. We do not know what God has commanded or forbidden us. We cannot tell good from evil, light from darkness, the commandments of God from the ordinances of men. Without the gospel, everything is useless and vain. 
Without the gospel, we are not Christians. Without the gospel, all riches is poverty, all wisdom folly before God. Strength is weakness, and all the justice of man is under the condemnation of God. But by the knowledge of the gospel, we are made children of God, brothers of Jesus Christ, fellow townsmen with the saints, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, heirs of God with Jesus Christ, by whom? The poor are made rich, the weak strong, the fools wise, the sinners justified, the desolate comforted, the doubting sure, and slaves free. The gospel is the word of life and truth. It is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe and the key to the knowledge of God, which opens the door of the kingdom of heaven to the faithful by releasing them from their sins and closing it to the unbelievers, binding them in their sins. This is what the gospel is. It is good news. It is good news for those who are lost. It shows them how they might be found. It's good news for the blind. It shows them what they might now see. It's good news for the dead, making them alive. So the gospel is good news, and the gospel is all about Jesus. That was John Calvin 500 or so years ago. More contemporary, an American author, preacher, pastor, now in glory, Tim Keller said this. He said, the gospel is not just the ABCs, but the A to Z of the Christian life. It's not just the beginning. It's the whole story. It is inaccurate to think that the gospel is what saves non-Christians, and then, not, then Christians mature by trying hard to live according to biblical principles. No. The gospel is the Christian life from entrance to continuation, to conclusion, the beginning, the middle, and the end. A famous missionary church leader in the 19th century, A.B. Simpson, uh, founded the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church, not a large church in the Northern Hemisphere, but quite significant in South America. <coughs> Simpson said, the gospel tells rebellious men that God is reconciled, that justice is satisfied, that sin has been atoned for, that the judgment of the guilty may be revoked, the condemnation of the sinner canceled, the curse of the law blotted out, the gates of hell closed, the portals of heaven open wide, the power of sin subdued, the guilty conscience healed, the broken heart comforted, the sorrow and misery of the fall undone. That's what the gospel is. Good news for you and for me. Good news for the 930 prisoners in Edinburgh prison. Good news for the city of Edinburgh and 500,000 people that call Edinburgh home. And good news for the kingdom of Fife. We desperately need good news. Go to the BBC website, go to tele the television channels, whatever channel you watch, there is bad news, bad news internationally, bad news nationally, bad news locally, but the gospel is good news, and that's why Paul is not ashamed. Why would you be ashamed of good news? Why would you be ashamed of hope, ashamed of help, or ashamed of comfort? So first and foremost, the gospel is good, good news. Secondly, the gospel is powerful. I am not ashamed of the gospel, says Paul, because it is the power of God. Now, we can't do justice really to this. God is able to make something out of nothing. That's the measure of his power. He calls the universe into existence when there was no universe. Now, you and I might have some construction skills. Maybe, maybe you're good at DIY. Maybe you can install things or build things. If, if you go to Ikea, you can get a flat pack 
uh, bookcase and you can put, uh, not that I would want to do that, but you could put the flat pack together and hopefully create a bookcase. God speaks to nothing and something comes forth. God speaks to an empty void and all of a sudden there's heaven, there's earth, there's creatures on the land, there's creatures in the air, there's creatures in the sea, there's men, there's women, there's human beings. That's what God can do. And that's the measure of his power. There's two scenes that are captured in the period in the history of the church called the Great Awakening. There were two great preachers, or many great preachers, but two stand out. One was named John Wesley. He was the founder of modern Methodism. Another was George Whitfield. And God was at work at a time when vital Christianity was at a very low ebb. There was very little in the way of gospel preaching. There was very little in the way of Christian living. So immorality was high. Gospel preaching was low. And many people were untouched by the church. Sound familiar? That's 1730s. That's, that's not today I'm talking about. That's almost 300 years ago. And what does God do when the cause is at a low ebb? He raises up witnesses, preachers, pastors, and the church does not welcome these men with open arms, quite the opposite. Wesley, Whitfield were barred from most pulpits. They were not allowed to preach inside church. So what they decided to do was to preach outside. This scene that's captured in Whitfield's journal, it's 16, 1739, is the first time he preached outside in London. Listen to this. Preached in the morning at Moorfields, it's a large open space in London, to an exceeding great multitude. Being weakened by my morning's preaching, in the afternoon I refreshed myself with a little sleep, and at five went and preached at Kennington Common. That's south of the River Thames, large open space, about two miles from London, where no less than 30,000 people were supposed to be present. The wind being for me carried the voice to the extremest part of the audience, all stood attentive and joined in the psalm and the Lord's Prayer most regularly. I scarce ever preached more quietly in any church. The word came with power. The people were much affected and expressed their love to me in many ways. All agreed it was never seen on this wise before. Oh, that what need have all God's people to rejoice and give thanks. I hope a good inroad has been made into the devil's kingdom this day. 30,000 people in a park in the south of London. One preacher, they stood attentive. They sang when he sang, they prayed when he prayed, and they listened when he preached. This is the power of God evidenced in the gospel. So that was London. Let me just share this scene in Newcastle. So this is John Wesley. John Wesley was a regular visitor to Newcastle. In fact, Wesley, there were three centers that Wesley was particularly fond of. Newcastle in the north, Bristol in the southwest, and London in the southeast. The first time he ever went to Newcastle, this was the scene. And this is 1742, came to Newcastle upon Tyne. We, we came to Newcastle about six. And after a short refreshment, this is Friday afternoon, walked into the town. I was surprised. So much drunkenness, cursing, and swearing, even from the mouths of little children, do I never remember to have seen and heard before in so small a compass of time. Surely this place is ripe for him who came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, sometimes we look around us and we see immorality. We see sin. We see indifference. We see the whole thing. And our reaction can be, this is terrible. What awful things. What does Wesley say? I'm in the right place. 
I'm in the right place because I've got the right message. Jesus has not come to call righteous people. Jesus has not come to make good people better. Jesus has come to call sinners to repentance. And I don't know about Fife, but there's lots of sinners in Edinburgh. We're surrounded by them. I would suggest that you're surrounded by them too. And sometimes we look and we can become discouraged or disheartened, but no. Wesley said, I'm exactly where I'm meant to be. That was Friday afternoon. Sunday morning, seven in the morning, this is the scene from his diary. At seven, I walked to the sand gate, the poorest and most contemptible part of the town. And standing at the end of the street with John Taylor began to sing the hundredth psalm. Three or four people came out to see what was the matter, who soon increased to four or five hundred. I suppose there might be twelve or fifteen hundred before I was done preaching to whom I applied those solemn words. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. Isaiah 53. Observing the people when I had done to stand gaping and staring upon me with the most profound astonishment, I told them, if you desire to know who I am, my name is John Wesley. At five in the evening, with God's help, I designed to preach here again. At five... The hill on which I designed to preach was covered from top to bottom. I never saw so large a number of people together, either in Moorfields or at Kennington Common. We had heard just a moment ago that Whitfield preached to 30,000 people at Kennington Common. Wesley says, Newcastle, there were more than 30,000 people gathered on this hill to hear him preach. That is the power of the gospel. C.H. Spurgeon in the 19th century put it this way, Never, I pray you, brethren, lose heart in the power of the gospel. Do not believe that there exists any man, much less any race of men, for whom the gospel is not fitted. The gospel message is powerful and is transformative. When I go into Edinburgh prison, I am not looking for good people whom God might make better. I'm not looking for candidates who have traces of goodness in them. When I preach at Saukton, I preach the good news to the people in front of me, some of whom I know what they're in for, most of whom I don't, but it doesn't matter because sin is slavery, says Jesus, and only Jesus can set people free. All I can do is be a signpost. All I can do is be a preacher and to tell them what they must do to be saved. So the gospel is good news. The gospel is powerful. And the gospel is personal. And, and, and you and I, if you're a Christian here tonight, you know this is personal to you and personal to me. I can tell you what Jesus has done, absolutely. But I can tell you what Jesus has done for me. If I didn't preach on Romans 1.16, I would have preached on Galatians 2.20, where the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and who gave himself for me. This gospel is personal. Because we're told that the gospel brings salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone. First the Jew, then the Gentile. That's another way that Paul just saying everyone. Jews plus Gentiles equals everyone. It's as if we were to say people from the Northern Hemisphere, people from the Southern Hemisphere. That's everyone. Men and women. That's everyone. So the gospel is personal. And the gospel is for you and for me. George Whitfield, the great preacher who I mentioned a moment ago, he once put it this way. He said, other men may preach the gospel better than I, but no man can preach a better gospel. There is no better message than this. There is no more powerful message than this. There is no more message that is better suited for human beings than this message. One of the great American evangelists, D.L. Moody of a previous generation, 
So if you think of Billy Graham in the 20th and 21st century, that was D.L. Moody in the 19th century. And he put it this way. He said, a rule I have had for years is to treat the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal friend. He is not a creed, a mere doctrine, but it is he himself we have. Now, Christians may belong to different denominations. They may have different forms of church government. They may have different elements of their theology. Those things are important to an extent, but the first and foremost thing of importance is Jesus himself. We have him, and we have all that we need in him. D.L. Moody was a large man, physically large man, and he was a great preacher in the sense that he used illustrations that people could get. He said, doctrines are all right in their places, but when you put them in the place of faith or salvation, they become sin. If a man should ask me to his house for dinner tonight, tomorrow, the street would be a very good thing to take me to his house. But if I didn't get into the house, I wouldn't get any dinner. Now, a creed is a road or a street. It is very good as far as it goes. But if it doesn't take us to Christ, it is worthless. So if people say, I, if people identify Jesus as the Son of God, it's good. If people identify Jesus as the Savior of the world, that's good. If people recognize that he lived a sinless life and he died a sacrificial death and he rose from the dead, wonderful. But none of those are statements of faith because you can articulate things about Jesus, but actually the gospel is believing in Jesus, placing your faith in him, personal, placing your whole heart and life and past, present, and future in his hands. Gospel is good news. The gospel is powerful. The gospel is personal. And in the history of God's people, there are some extraordinary people. C.H. Spurgeon was an extraordinary preacher. George Whitfield, John Wesley, extraordinary evangelists. I don't know about you. I'm very ordinary. I'm very ordinary. I know Jesus. I love Jesus. I want to tell other people about Jesus, but I don't have extraordinary gifts or extraordinary capacity. And I'm, and I'm comforted by the words of Hudson Taylor. Taylor said, God is not looking for men and women of great faith. He is looking for common people to trust his great faithfulness. I don't think that I particularly have a strong faith, but I'll tell you this, the object of my faith is strong. The strength of my faith is immaterial, but the object of my faith is strong. And D.L. Moody put it this way, God doesn't expect the impossible from us. He wants us to expect the impossible from him. God doesn't expect the impossible from us. He wants us to expect the impossible from him. That is powerful. I can't save people. I can't persuade people to be Christians. I can't solve people's problems. I can't fix people's hearts. I can't forgive people's sins, and neither can you. But I tell you what, I know someone who can. I know someone who does. I know someone who has a 100% track record. Many people that I minister in prison, to, to in prison, are hopeless cases. Social work has tried their best. Criminal justice tried their best. Mothers, grandmothers, parents, grandparents, they've tried their best. And these are hopeless situations. But I'm told that there is no such thing as a hopeless situation with Jesus. Wherever you are, whatever you do, you are an ordinary person, but you have an extraordinary Savior. You are an ordinary man or woman, but you have an extraordinary gospel of an extraordinary Jesus who does extraordinary work through the 
witness and through the service of very ordinary people. May God bless you and do pray for the work of the gospel in Scotland's prison, whether it's Castle Huntley near Dundee, Glen Ockel, Perth, Barlinny and Lomos in Glasgow, HMP Stockton, Inverness, Aberdeen or Grampian. There are thousands of men and women behind bars. Only one person can set them free. He has a 100% success rate. Let's pray. Father in heaven, hear us, help us, do us good, bless us abundantly, forgive us our sins, forgive us our unbelief, and remind us of how great and good you are and how powerful and personal your gospel is. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.